Well, <laughs> y'all, it's bedtime. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I am tired. I am stiff. I am exhausted. I was ready to do this at 11 a.m. this morning. <laughs> and now I'm just like, oh my gosh, I know what's going to happen. If I try to recite my talk, it's going to be like trying to suck a really frozen slushy. See, my brain's already doing the thing through a really narrow straw. Have you, do you know how frustrating that is? Yeah. So I'm just going to rely on my script. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. You know what? You are my hero, Chloe. Let me tell you why, because I love Brene Brown. Yes, and I'm like having a conversation with you. I'm like, can we just like talk here? Okay, so what I love about Brene Brown is what she says about authentic leadership, and it is the courage to show up even when you cannot control the outcome, and that's where we're at tonight, okay? So, big round of applause for Chloe, please, please. Like, the beauty of imperfection. My fear was realized, and she showed me how to navigate it, so. Really, really grateful for you, Chloe. And then I'm thinking of Peter's talk and what he shared, and I was like, oh, dream, fact, feeling, and then eventually realization. I'm like, the dream was to be here one day. The fact is I'm here and I want to go home. <laughs> what to do, what to do, but thank you, thank you. Well, I am so grateful to have you all here. I'm so thankful that you are lending your ears, opening up your minds, and allowing your hearts to be stirred by topics you may or may not have been interested in, but hopefully you walk away with a new, fresh perspective. So the title of my talk is Imposter Syndrome, It's Not You, It's What Happened to You. We're gonna begin with a loose definition for those of us that may not be familiar with what it is. Lightly put, imposter syndrome is doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud even though your performance is adequate and likely above average. People have a hard time taking it seriously because they just think you're insecure and they want to be helpful, so they'll say lovely things like, don't make it harder than it is. You're supposed to fake it until you make it. Or, you know, you just need to trust yourself. Stop worrying. You are fine. But let me tell you why that rarely works. Imposter syndrome actually has its origins in trauma. Now, before I lose you, consider this. Even though imposter syndrome is flippantly tossed around the office, if you can just catch it and then peel back the layers, you will often discover an origin story that is pickled with difficulty, complexity, and imbalance. It is not irrational. It's not something light, small, and fluffy that hopped into your head. It is neurobiological. It is actually a deeply rooted way of behaving that is meant to support you or help you navigate unsupportive environments. What I mean is, if your situation required you to emphasize productivity, efficiency, and good behavior way more than it emphasized your true, whole, authentic self, then you were raised on the breeding grounds of imposter syndrome. All you need to do is inhale the pressure to live up to someone else's definition of success and snap, you have contracted it. And then your chances of presenting as symptomatic compounds like interest if you are a firstborn, only child, grew up poor, identify with a minority group, 
and or come from a single parent or blended household. Once the conditions are right, imposter syndrome will settle in and crouch and lie and wait until an event or transition that requires you to leave your comfort zone. Three of the most common that I have seen are suddenly having big shoes to fill, having to be out on your own, or having to compete for a seat at the table. These, these opportunities feel like obstacles because they do not fit what you know, they are not familiar to you, so you start doubting yourself and you wonder, who am I? to play big. Despite my angle, imposter syndrome isn't a disease, but it can be debilitating with real life consequences on your ability to lead, love, and perform. So let's get to it. I'm Shaba. <laughs> I am a trauma-informed licensed therapist, and I'm going to walk you through the ripple effect of relational trauma and how it forms imposter syndrome over time. Here's a really interesting thing that you may not know about trauma. There are actually two types. There is big T trauma and then there is little t trauma. Big T trauma is obvious. Think wars, earthquakes, violence. But little t trauma, it's more subtle, more like bullying, breakups, rejection, or having to move around frequently. Which do you have? I like the way my mentor puts it. It actually does not matter because big T trauma explodes on you while little t trauma erodes away at your confidence and sense of safety over time. Today, we are interested in little t trauma because that's where a lot of overlooked relational trauma camps out. Relational trauma is the thing that happens in your formative years where your sense of feeling loved and protected is consistently disrupted outside of your control and sometimes even your parents' control. Okay. So maybe the word trauma just doesn't resonate for you because you don't want to blame, you don't want to play the victim, you know so many others have it much worse. Here's my ask of you today. From a behavioral perspective, consider that trauma shows up in one of two ways. It either causes you to overfunction or under function. So just take a moment to see if you've ever had stints in life where you're described as overdoing it or underdoing it, where you're either all on or all off, and you can't find a middle ground. Moderation simply is not an option. Most of the people who come to see me are classic overfunctioners who start to freak out because they start getting sluggish or committing the cardinal sin, dropping the ball. Since society sees them as high performing and high producing and high functioning, they never feel the burn until a key area of their life starts to suffer, like romance, parenting, performance reviews, or the big one that really gets their attention, their physical health. By staying with me to the end of this talk, you will get the chance to determine how you may have been impacted by the ripples of relational trauma and find out for yourself how imposter syndrome may be holding you hostage to an unfair view of yourself, your abilities, and your responsibilities. Fair warning, I am a therapist, so while it's not all your mom, it definitely is childhood. <laughs> Some of you are out there like, wait a minute, I have imposter syndrome and I had a great childhood, and you know what? I cherish that with you, I am so happy, and things can be great 
and still missing key ingredients for your all-around success, that's pretty normal. You're allowed to be grateful for the shoulders you stand on and honor what they weren't able to provide for you because they didn't have access to it themselves. Also, another little secret that you probably don't know about trauma, trauma is not just the bad things that happen to you, it's also the good things that didn't. The bottom line is, if you chronically struggle with imposter syndrome, you are overcompensating for something that was missing at an earlier time, and you're probably going to need some help unpacking that. Feel free to approach me later on this and people. Okay, so do you have a hunch that maybe you have it or someone you know might have it? Now's your chance to shed some light on how things may have gotten this way for you or them. Listen to my story with imposter syndrome and see if there's any truth in it for you. I can trace the ripples of my own imposter syndrome as far back as fifth grade, but I'm sure they go further back than that. Since memories don't function as history though, I'm just gonna say this is based on a true story. Our South Asian immigrant family didn't talk much, but we got told plenty. We were in what psychologists call an authoritarian household, which is code for very strict. There were high standards, rigid rules, and plenty of critical feedback that was meant to be helpful and keep us on track for the American dream, but really looking back, we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't have the mentors, and we didn't have the proper community resources. But I digress, and we'll go back to family dynamics. Besides doing as you were told, you were left to your own devices to figure things out and learn from your mistakes on your own without a ton of emotional support or psychological guidance. The underlying message, don't fail because failure's not an option. No one was trying to be mean or unsupportive Everyone was doing the best that they could with the resources that they had at the time. Plus, it's really tough to fully be there for who you love when you're irritable and stressed and on edge all the time. The final main feature of my family that I'd like to share with you, we weren't talkers, but we were deep feelers. Dad managed his big feelings by adopting a kind of stoicism, and my mom clung to her spirituality to work out her stress. My feelers took more of a survival approach and narrowed down my, option to, my options to two modes of functioning. You guessed it, either over-functioning or under-functioning. That's to say I managed my big feelings by either staying busy and working hard or by numbing and checking out. Later, this translated into a seesaw of hyper-productivity followed by benders of procrastination. And that actually isn't uncommon for people with imposter syndrome. Think tortoise and the hare. Your nervous system unconsciously decides when to conserve resources, Chulu, and when to act swiftly, hair. One morning, it was one of those act swiftly moments for a 10-year-old Sheba. I can't explain how I knew, but I just felt the urge that I need to stay home that day, and the chances were unlikely since nothing short of a fever ever landed me stay-at-home privileges, but surprisingly, I was allowed to stay that day. Looking back now, it's probably because Dad knew my mom was struggling and could use some help looking after my one-year-old sister at the time. In in service of sparing you the gritty details, I'll summarize it this way. That was the day my mother attempted to take her own life. 
but by a stroke of luck, 10-year-old me happened to be there and was able to swoop in and save her. I didn't know it at the time, but I can tell now, that was the moment I started to actively compartmentalize and split. I became a double agent who had to be a grown-up and a kid at the same time. The kid was shoved to the back seat while someone who grew up too fast took the wheel. I had two versions of me. There was the real me with needs, wounds, feelings. Then there was the performative me who was polished, upbeat, hyper-independent. I helped mom raise my siblings. I became her mental health advocate, dad's right-hand man, basically their marriage counselor, compartmentalizing everything, helped me not complain, and I was able to keep my emotions at bay because I just kept them in a little box I never went to. That all sounds pretty impressive until you realize no underage person should have a resume like that. But that's where my habit of over-functioning to make up for members who are under-functioning began. So there you have it, the groundwork for my imposter syndrome. It involved five main components, the pressure of high standards, emotional suppression, hyper-compartmentalization, growing up too fast, and over-functioning. These coping styles compiled to create the profile of the imposter. Because when you have an origin story that requires high performance to put out fires and fill in the gaps and keep spirits high, you are set up to wonder as an adult, well, besides being a fixer, doer, and helper, who am I? And why am I so unhappy? Did I just bluff my way through life? Guess I just need to do more and try harder. <laughs> so you end up burning the candle at both ends. With imposter syndrome, you were never allowed to be fully you. At an earlier time, you had to become what was needed instead of what was natural. Of course you feel like a fake. You've been more true to others than you have to yourself for a really long time. I hope you're starting to see it. Your cake won't look the same as mine, but it will have similar ingredients. Now, if you're still on the fence about whether or not you have it, or you just want a couple of highlights to be able to see how it looks at work, look out for these things. Despite working twice as hard, you fear being only half as good. And funnily enough, even if someone tries to praise or reassure you, you will deflect it and credit it to something like luck, someone's oversight, divine intervention, or just say, bah, it was nothing. Imposter syndrome also means you never get to relax because the wheels of guilt and pressure are grinding you into overthinking, overplanning, and spreading yourself super thin. You allow it in hopes that one day it will all be worth it, only to end up with your head spinning after smacking into the brick wall of burnout. How many of you are nodding along saying, yep, shut up in there, still doing that? How many of you are sitting here thinking, wow, I would love to be on stage doing something like that, but what would I even have to say? No, I'm just going to leave it up to the professionals. I see you and the shadow of imposter syndrome behind you. I wish we could chalk up imposter syndrome to something like dashes of insecurity, remedied by doses of confidence, thought management, affirmations, but by now you can tell it is more sinister than that. In terms of my clientele, when a person comes to see me, they are typically struggling with the inevitable burnout that comes from this high-performance, high-anxiety-filled lifestyle. And I am an enthusiast about working with them because I can relate. I remember reaching that point. 
it took me over a quarter century to finally see myself clearly for the first time. I discovered that I had been swimming in a sort of high-functioning anxiety and depression soup ever since the fifth grade, but I didn't know any better because it was the air that I breathed. And then I discovered that my over-involvement as a fixer and helper type in people's lives was actually less about them, more about me and my need for control and inner peace. I couldn't stand seeing the people that I love struggle, so I would swoop in without being asked, cue those go the extra mile and overachiever tendencies. So. What sequence of events exactly led to my moment of truth? I would have to say it was the moment where I was no longer able to keep up the wall between the shiny stage me and the mess he overwhelmed me. The consequences at the time, though, my marriage dissolved, my family was confused, my spiritual community was disappointed. My health took a hit. I was doubting my profession. I socially withdrew. I physically could not go back to working myself into the ground. Something had to change. And that's where I know that so many of you have similar stories, many of you who feel like everything's on, t on track, there's no reason to complain, and that you probably think or feel like you had a great childhood. So. Your imposter syndrome is just a quirky you thing. I get it, me too. But if you don't want a crash and burn like mine, then I implore you to be proactive instead of reactive. Get help because you want it, not because you need it. It was only when this therapist started going to therapy that she was able to get to the bottom of the divide that was pulling her apart. The battle between the real me and the performative me. So here's what we really need to understand about imposter syndrome. It's not in your head. It's wired into your body. It's a coping style jam-packed with action. Your self-doubt, low confidence, and fraudulent feelings are all stemming from a fear response that is stored in your body and remember that trauma isn't just big T. It can also be having two parents, but really only having one. If you know, you know. It's being socially othered because you're hairy, short, big-nosed, gay, red-headed, or black-skinned. It can also be as simple as just having family and friends that you had to support a lot as a kid. The thing that helped me overcome my, or the thing that helped me overcome the debilitating aspects of my imposter syndrome was processing and working through the ripple effect of relational trauma on me and my confidence. Now, if you were listening to my story, you might be like, Shepa, but I didn't have a loved one try to take their life in front of me. Okay, here's what I will say. As a therapist, I hear plenty of shocking things, and it's not because of the actual content, but because of how cool, distant, aloof, and eerie the story a person is telling me when they're reporting on the really hard things they went through. I'm sitting here going, oh my God, and they're like, it's cloudy outside. <laughs> so. In sitting with me today, I would like for you to consider whether or not big or little t trauma could be hiding behind your imposter syndrome. If so, being able to look at it could be really helpful. I mean, this is the thing if you want to dial down the um, overfunctioning and if you want to enhance your prowess for authentic presence and transformational leadership. So instead of dismissing imposter syndrome, what if we could show up just a little bit more trauma aware and not minimize our colleagues or our own trauma? What if we could actually, with curiosity and courage, 
investigate it a little bit more and come up with systems, processes, containers that actually support and cultivate our best and highest selves. If this conversation has gotten you thinking about imposter syndrome diff differently, then that is a huge win for your awareness. And if you are wanting a trauma-informed way of working with your imposter syndrome and reclaiming joy in your life, I can definitely recommend you some resources. Y'all have been great. Thank you.